please welcome to the stage Anir Van Gosh. Uh, thanks, Bruno. <clears throat> so the thing that is going to have the most important effect on your health over the next several years is your genetics, and particularly your genome sequence. And so it is important for you to understand what your genome is and how that understanding could improve your health in the future. So right now, if you go see a doctor for a set of symptoms, um, he or she prescribes a medicine, and um, hopefully you get better, but sometimes you don't get better. And if you do not respond to the treatment, uh, it is frustrating, uh, it can be debilitating, and in the worst cases, it can be life-threatening. Now, the reason the doctor prescribed the medicine is because it works for a lot of people. But the reason it doesn't work for you is your genetics. There's something in your background that doesn't allow the drug to act as it does in a lot of other people. Now, right now, your doctor cannot do very much about it because he or she does not have access to your genome information. And even if they did, they would not know the relationship between the genetics and drug response. And I think that this is going to dramatically change over the next few years. And I just want to talk a little bit about how it might impact the treatment of mental illness. So imagine <clears throat> an alternate future where when you go see a doctor and you have a set of symptoms, that not only do they say that based on these symptoms, uh, this is the most likely disorder that you have, but that people with this symptom tend to fall into three categories, say type A, type B, and type C, and have access to your genetic information, and they say based on that, you are a type A patient, and so the treatment for you should be the type A treatment, and when you take that medicine, then you get better in a much more reliable way than it is possible now. Now, I'm particularly optimistic that this kind of approach might very well transform the treatment of mental illness, because there have been dramatic uh, increases in our understanding of the genetics of mental disorders, as I'll explain uh, in, a, in the next few slides. Um, but also to highlight the fact that mental illness, psychiatric conditions, are among those that have the strongest genetic component. <clears throat> this is indicated over here. So in a disorder like autism spectrum disorder, among identical twins, the concordance of having autism is between 60 and 80 percent. And that compares to a number of about 1 percent in the general population. So this illustrates that there's a very strong genetic component in a disorder like autism, and there's also a significant component, a genetic component in a disorder like schizophrenia. And autism and schizophrenia are probably the two most prevalent neurodevelopment and psychiatric indications that we, that we face now. And on the, on the right-hand side, you can see that if you look across a number of different indications, the genetic component that contributes to disorders like autism and schizophrenia are really near the top of the chart. Now, we have known this for a long time because of twin studies, but we did not know what the underlying genes were. And um, it was really only in the last five years, uh, with the advent of a number of new gene sequencing methods, that we have begun to understand the genetic architecture of these disorders, and we're learning a lot about what drives these disorders. So the first thing <clears throat> is that these disorders can be caused by a number of genes that are scattered throughout the genome. The slide shows that the risk genes for a disorder like autism are spread across all chromosomes, and we have learned a couple of things. There are probably a couple of hundred genes that can be strong risk factors for a disorder like autism. And we also know that basically there are two kinds of risk genes. The first class are called common variants. And these are variants in the gene that are present in a large fraction of the population. All of us are carrying some of them. Uh, but they don't contribute to very large increased risk. They lead to a small increased risk of the disorder. And <clears throat> there are many of these genes. The second category are rare variants. And these are... Uh, present in a much smaller fraction of the population, but they have a much larger effect size. So if you have one of those rare mutations, it is much more likely that you'll get the disorder compared to the general population. So all of us carry this combination of common and rare variants, and it is the synthesis of all these genetic variants that determines whether or not we end up developing one of these disorders. So if I were to illustrate the common variants with these uh, blue circles, and the rare variants with the red ones, then on one extreme we have those disorders that are strongly or almost entirely driven 
by single rare mutations. And the example we heard a couple of times in this meeting is Huntington's disease. So if you have a certain triplet repeat expansion in Huntington's disease, you will almost certainly get the disorder. <clears throat> it's a monogenic disorder. Most psychiatric conditions do not fall in that category. They are a combination of rare and common variants that drive the disorder. Most of us, although we carry these risk genes, have a total burden that is below a certain threshold so that they do not get manifest as illness. But in a certain fraction of the population, in a pretty significant fraction, uh, those genetic variations are at a level that they get manifest as a disorder such as schizophrenia or autism. Now, from all of these genetic studies, not only have we learned something about the overall architecture, the genetic architecture of the disorders, but we're learning a lot about the specific genes that are driving this, these disorders, and the comparison between disorders like schizophrenia and autism is very instructive. So one of the largest studies in schizophrenia genetics that was published last year um, is from the Psychiatry Genomics Consortium, and it was a study of common variant risk factors in about 40,000 schizophrenics compared to about 100,000 controls. And um, in that study, they identified 108 loci that confer significant risk of a background for the development of schizophrenia. And when you look at the kinds of genes that are identified as risk genes, and this is illustrated here, they fall into certain categories. For example, uh, genes that are involved in, um, in ion channel function, like calcium channel functions, feature prominently. Genes that, involve, that are involved in synaptic transmission feature prominently. Genes that are targets of a uh, RNA binding protein called FMRP are highly represented. So you start to say that it's not this random scattering of genes, but certain classes of genes seem to dispose one towards a disorder like schizophrenia. Now, if you compare this with an autism study, which is a different methodology, this is a whole exome sequencing study, two different studies also published last year. It gives you a sense of the pace of advance in this field. Um, what you find, again, a large number of genes that can confer, confer a risk for autism. And when you look at the kinds of genes that they map to, you see that it looks very similar to what we just saw for schizophrenia. There are voltage-gated ion channels. There are genes that are involved in synaptic transmission. There are genes that are uh, targets of this RNA binding protein called FMRP. And this was really an important and unexpected revelation in the field, which is that these two disorders that are manifested very differently, autism is diagnosed in kids, they are characterized by severe social dysfunction, repetitive behavior. Schizophrenia is diagnosed in young adults usually and uh, characterized by positive symptoms, negative symptoms, cognitive symptoms. They appear quite different in the clinic. They have very similar underlying genetics. And so we believe <clears throat> that the underlying causes of these disorders is actually very similar, but something about either the environment or the background genetics determines how and when the disorders are manifest. And this turns out to be the case not only for autism and schizophrenia, but <clears throat> as one looks across a number of other indications, for example, ADHD or bipolar disorder, you find the same theme, which is that there is a significant convergence in the genetic risk that underlies a large range of, um, of mental illness. <clears throat> so, so all of this understanding then has brought us to a place where we have, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a framework of thinking about how genetic variation leads to a behavioral disorder. So we believe that the genetic risk is manifest in an altered function of proteins, many of which function at the synapse. And this altered synaptic function leads to a change in the function of certain neural circuits that underlie these core behavioral domains. <clears throat> and it is the circuit dysfunction and the behavioral consequence of it that is manifested as a disorder like schizophrenia <clears throat> or autism. So based on this understanding, we are engaged in a fairly major drug discovery effort to use this genetic understanding to develop the next generation of medicines for these disorders. And it is driven in part by our understanding of the genetics and asking what are the common pathways that are affected in disorders like autism and schizophrenia. Now, one of the challenges is that even though we know the genetic risk, it is very hard to assess what the synaptic dysfunction is in a patient. And uh, for that, there is another technology that has emerged that is going to be very helpful, and that is of patient-derived stem cells. 
So what we can do now is we can take cells from individuals that have autism or schizophrenia, that have a known genetic risk, and we can ask whether or not cells that are derived from these patients show a cellular phenotype that is indicative of the disorder. And this is something that we have just completed in a fairly extensive collaboration with the Harvard Medical School, where we uh, took a large number of autistic subjects. They were genotyped. We identified the genetic mutations that were driving the disorder. We generated iPS cells from these patients, and those were then differentiated into neurons. And then we we're in the process of characterizing the phenotype of those neurons from controlled individuals, usually an un unaffected family member, and the affected individual, to ask what are the cellular consequences of this genetic variation so that we can then use it as a drug discovery platform to reverse the cellular phenotypes and eventually bring it back to the clinic. <clears throat> One last thing that I want to point out is the, um, the effort to understand how the genetic background contributes to the manifestation of a disorder. So we know quite a bit about the risk genes, but I also told you that there will be people who carry a risk gene who may or may not manifest a disorder. And we believe a lot of that will depend on their background genetics. The studies that I've talked about so far have mainly been studies where you sequence small bits of the DNA, like an exome sequence study, but this is rapidly changing into a world where we have whole genome studies. And these are just two examples of currently ongoing study. One of them is a collaboration between Autism Speaks and Google's, Google, where they're sequencing 10,000 individuals <clears throat> that, are, that have a disorder. And there's a similar study uh, ongoing for schizophrenia. And we believe that these studies will be quite transformative in allowing us to understand not only <clears throat> what the risk genetics are, but how the background genetics influences progression of a disease. <clears throat> so I just want to close by um, highlighting that anyone here or, or people that you know who work in any area of neuroscience can contribute to this effort because it's going to take a lot of work to bring all the pieces together so that we can develop the kind of medicines I'm talking about that are tailored to specific individuals based on their genetics. On one hand, there is work to be done on understanding the diversity of patients <clears throat> and the relationship between genetic variation and phenotypic variation. For all the clinicians in the room, I think this is a great opportunity. The, the cost of sequencing is, is very low now, and if you have the ability to collect large cohorts of individuals, this provides a great opportunity to understand <clears throat> the relationship between genetic variation and clinical phenotype. On the basic science side, we're very interested in identifying the cellular phenotypes that can be identified at the stem cell level. Uh, if you're a cell biologist, this is something you can contribute to. And if you're a mouse behavioral pharmacologist, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of generating mouse models that carry the same mutations that drive the human disease. And we believe that if we have these pieces <clears throat> in place, then we should be able to get to the point where we can understand how specific genetic variation leads to a particular circuit dysfunction that is manifested as a, as a disorder. And then based on your individual genetics, one can develop treatments that will be most effective for you. Thank you.